were given the task of selling fireworks and you had 30 seconds to sell fireworks for 4th of July, how would you sell them? Do you hate oh, dogs? <laughs> <laughs> Very white because I'm in front of you. No. Is, is that different than normal? <laughs> the episodes where like my jokes don't land, I just go to my bedroom and cry like a like a 14 year old girl. Normally I act like a 16 year old. All right, so this is the end of the fake start of the show and it's gonna be the beginning of the real start of the show, which I'm really excited about. Um, hello, friends, lovers, countrymen. I, I am now craving a shower with apparently high water pressure. The shower here is like really mediocre and so maybe if we have any shower manufacturers in the chat, they can throw me some ads right now. I'm getting vulnerable. <laughs> and if you make showers, you might want to sponsor us. Like, this is going to be the weirdest place where you'll ever expect, like, shower head, like, commercial. <laughs> <laughs> On the f***ing copy that shit. <laughs> One of the first major criticisms that Mark Ford had for me was, your copy sounds like copy. F***ing stop that shit. It sounds like yeah. shit. Get the f*** out of here with that used car salesman shit. And we are live. Are we live? We might be dying. Luke, you're back from Germany and you're back in your bathroom. I am back in my bathroom indeed. <laughs> you know, honestly, like, sometimes clients are just f***ing stupid. And <laughs> like, there was this uh, type of bean where a monkey eats them and then poops it out and the enzymes partially digest the coffee and then people make coffee with these partially digested coffee bean from Sumatra or something like that. Apparently it's like the most expensive coffee you can buy. This is gonna be a great bit. I, like, I can already tell like Noah's gonna like make this the intro. If you want to make money by like starting your own business or starting a hobby job or starting a side hustle that then can grow into a business, uh, the best way to do it is to do it reluctantly. To have a nine to five job and then whatever you do for your side hustle or for your prospective future business, you work a nine to five and then you work a five to nine. And that could be five to nine in the morning or it could be five to nine at night. This is a completely new way to trade the markets. That line is in almost every single successful financial problem. Not, not, is... not just in the headline, just like somewhere. Just somewhere. There are a lot of paths into this career. There's no one path. And so it really doesn't matter what you do to get started, so yeah. long as you get started. Start pressing down on the gas pedal and start studying. Start working at something. Start deliberately and in a focused manner trying to cultivate this skill. You're going to get somewhere. Repetition legitimizes. Repetition legitimizes. Do you guys know why repetition legitimizes? Because you forget the source of where you heard stuff. No, it's because repetition legitimizes. When you're talking about the different stages of awareness and thinking about the next ad that you're going to write, take a moment to jot down at the top of your Word doc, what do you think, like whom are you writing to? What their desires, notions, and identifications are. And then write what level of awareness you think that that person has based on your product or based on the problem or in general. In any given market for any given niche or any given product, you're gonna have your discount buyers, the cheapos, the cheapskates, et cetera, et cetera, who are looking for a deal. You will always be able to reach out to them by offering the best deal. And then there is this grand wasteland in the middle, people with like different socioeconomic attitudes, different amounts of disposable income. And then you have your luxury buyers, your premium buyers. These are the people who will buy the same product if there's three extra digits attached to the end of the price tag. They, in their mind, associate high cost with high value. You make all your money by targeting one of those two groups, but by like targeting like the middle class, you're not gonna make any money. One way to sort of add subconsciously a lot of value to a brand or to a product is by using what's called a glicken. If you Google this, you're not gonna find a single freaking thing because I'm pretty sure they just made it up to refer to what I'm about to say, which is almost like a gummy bear benefit. It's almost like, oh, a, hey, here's a mint on your pillow kind of thing. You never try to get people to say at the Waldorf Astoria by leading off with the headline, by the way, we have the best mints. The mint is really just this really buried benefit. You almost don't even think about it. You almost mention it in passing as a like, oh, 
Well, that's nice. All the moments where I would just be right at the cusp of burnout were also the moments where I found my capacity stretching. There are Honda Civics and there are Toyota Corollas and guess what? <laughs> it's this, basically the same car. There are Toyota Camrys, there are Lexus EOS 7s. How do those companies market those products? They go one step removed from each other. They try to either leverage the brand and the goodwill that they have there, or they try to add one feature that the other competitor doesn't have. All of a sudden you have a product that is just slightly different from the competitor, and that is usually enough for a good copywriter to be able to sell a product really well. At the stages of people's awareness where they're less aware of something, you're not going to be able to win anybody over or get anybody's attention by intellectual means. What I mean by that is you can't be standing on a soapbox saying, man, what a deal on this thing that you don't know about that solves this problem that you might not have. You can have the best copy, the best sales argument in the world and you'll never be able to sell a thing because people aren't attracted to logical arguments out of the blue. There's always an emotional reason that people are drawn to things initially. And then mm -hmm. the logical reasoning comes in and backfills and justifies that attention. Businesses want to pay you more money. That probably sounds ridiculous at face value, but businesses if they can't afford to pay you more money, or if you are delivering the kind of value and work and results that can allow a business to afford your higher rates, your higher salary, an incentive structure, well, guess what? They are going to pay you more because they're getting more from you. And so you should demand and try to command as much money as humanly possible because what you deliver and render unto your clients, your employers, your partners, that value is a multiple of what you're getting, ideally. Get some very basic writing skills. That does not mean you need to be a novelist. However, having an understanding of grammar structures and the ways in which sentences can be combined and you can use commas and colons and very rarely semicolons is essential to doing the shop well because you need to understand what is in your toolkit to be able to use that toolkit to its maximum efficacy. The second thing is to start reading and consuming ads. Of course, everywhere you go, Facebook, Instagram, outside, there are ads everywhere. However, I think the tendency for people is to see the ads and not think about them. Once you start looking at the ads and seeing what kind of messages are they, are they saying, which are the things that actually make me want to buy or make my gaze linger on them, you will start to develop a sense of the patterns that are being employed there. And I think that's the extent of what you need to do starting out. Third, and this might be the most difficult, is to start figuring out what you're good at. And I don't mean what you're good at in terms of what kind of copy you're good at or what niche you want to write for, but very simply, what kinds of things are you as an individual good at? So for example, are you good at figuring out emotional appeals and what appeals to certain kinds of audiences? Do you really like structuring long form content? Are you the kind of person who wants to have a gigantic plan and then just run through the plan to create something larger? Do you like doing lots of different kinds of projects? The answer to these sorts of questions will inform what kinds of copy projects that you pursue. Because if you are someone, for example, who is really bad or who hates long form content, you should not be applying for long form sales letters or to be redoing someone's entire website where having that sort of coherence is essential to doing a good job. So once you have those three things, that lays the groundwork for you to get started. Do you want to address this person in the comments who said that Rob, Rob looks so out of place? Can you give him a book? Excuse me. I am basically Ty Lopez now. Knowledge. You have to be able to talk about the stages of awareness of the stages of awareness with your client. If they are not a copywriter, then you have to be able to walk them from they are unaware about all of these considerations that we have as copywriters to, okay, now you understand what the problems are for me if you're telling me to write a very direct lead for a problem that your audience doesn't understand to, okay, here are a couple of different ways we could tackle this. And so you can then justify that as you will make more money by using this thing if you let me put in a little bit more work to develop this offer for you. The USP doesn't have to be like physically real. There are plenty of brands who do their branding based off of like imagined or like 
intersubjective criteria like that. So like when you think about Ray-Ban's glasses, for example, oh, it's so luxurious, it's so fancy, it's so whatever, but that's not like a real thing. Think about some way in which that is literally true and then extrapolate that into like a larger idea, a story that you can kind of walk your people through as they're reading your copy. Click here right now. <laughs> do it yeah so i started off like most young americans i went to school got a degree in something that you should not get a degree in which is japanese literature because it was fun and i like reading books promptly realized that i did not want to do academia for a number of reasons and that you can't really do anything with a bachelor's in any kind of literature and so i became a translator and so I, I spent a number of years just doing Japanese to English translation for like across like a wide range of topics. That was probably where I got like the sort of writing itch because translation kind of gets this perception that it's like you put something in one side, it comes out the other and it's like a one to one, whatever. But there's a lot of like finagling with like word choice and tone and like the way in which you are choosing your words reflects a lot on the reader experience. And so like, what does your audience want to hear? What does your client need your audience to hear in order to get, like meet the objective that they're trying to like meet? You're doing a lot of that kind of thinking with translation. I got kind of fed up with the like sort of relationships I would have with clients because when a lot of people are hiring like an independent translator, the sort of relationship you have with them is like not actually too dissimilar from the relationship a lot of people have with their copywriter where it's like, I need X deliverable, give me the deliverable and not like, hey, you're a complex individual with a, like, a really specific skill set that can do a lot of different things. And so I'm gonna give you the creative liberty to do this in the best way you think it's gonna be most effective for me. You have to wonder, do you feel like that information is necessary? Or do you feel like that really all we need to do is say brand new knees in 90 days and bingo, bango, we have a headline? Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you could either. Because new, new brand new knees in 90 days can be literally like, I take you out back, chop your legs off, install new knees on you, wait 89 days to screw in that last screw. And then you have, I can say, oh, well, 90 days. What can we do to get you to look at our machine? Throw naked ladies on it. It's not just like, put sex on the thing and then the sex will sell. It is what sort of like pattern interrupt can you throw into the situation that is unusual, that is appealing, that will hit on a um, deeper level for people. One level higher than that is, it's not just the thing, but is what is the thing itself signaling? And so in the context of Playboy, it's not just attractive woman, it is also, well, what kind of person is surrounded by attractive women? Like when you think of Hugh Hefner, it's like a rich person who's well off, who has access to all this luxury or whatever, richness, yada, yada, yada. Don't you want to be that person? There are probably a lot of people out there who have been in a like copywriting adjacent field, who like have some sort of writing skills, who like have a sense of like how you put words on a page. For people like that, the best thing you can do is really start studying marketing, basically. I was like pretty decent at the writing part, but my sense of like, how these businesses are set up that I'm working with was not very great or like the business of copywriting, um, like conversions, like the, the idea that copy that converts is a thing is like not something I would, I ever thought of as a translator, even though that was literally what I was doing. Your biggest ROI is going to be on the marketing set. I'd say first figure out what you want to do. So if you are the kind of person who wants to work with individual clients in a specific industry, you definitely need to learn about the thing you're trying to write. This is like the research so that you can go and do research for your clients. The second is get like a solid base of like copywriting slash marketing skills so that you can actually like do the job to like a minimal level. And then three is just like start putting yourself out there. I think there are a lot of copywriting gigs that don't require you to be a particularly skilled copywriter, but will make you significantly more skilled once you get them under your belt, just like start doing the work so people can see that you're a hard worker. You should really get like about seven times as much information as to like what you're actually gonna write. Like uh, Ben Chivanga actually says like, you, you need to like dig deep. You need to like mine for that gold. You need to mine for that sales message or that USP that like still sets it apart from others. And I would say like, if you don't really know how it can compete with others, I think first you gotta like try, get as much info as you can do as much, uh, much research as you can and sort of like 
get like get that message that's going to appeal to like to your audience and if you then still can't do it then i think it's going to be a problem with the product i think a good exercise for this is just to ask yourself multiple times like ask what am i really selling and not just on the product side but like on the outcome side if you're selling a spa retreat you're not just selling that you're selling a getaway from work if you're selling baseball tickets you're not just selling tickets you're selling the memories that like you know parents are going to have with their children forever right like like if you keep asking yourself that question it's like what am i really selling you're going to create more or like you're going to think of more angles and different things that are like that make your product more special or more unique actually like this whole conversation reminds me of one i had with you before sean where you said like like as like an entrepreneur as a business person you can either live the life of this like brute that's like hunting for clients and like hunting to get food right and just to be able to you know sustain themselves in this like field or in this niche that they're working in or you can become this farmer that tends to his own land and builds something up and i would definitely say that something like a review website is definitely like a farmer but it's a lot of fucking work you know it's a lot of farming it's a lot of like plowing the land and like making sure that you're planting your seeds you know it's it's going to be monotone it's going to be boring it's going to be stupid at some point but in the end you're going to get more by doing that than you would if you're just you know always are on the lookout for getting a new client i finished university and i had like three grand on my bank account which was money from loans actually from student loans it wasn't really my own money and i was like well fuck. so i just kind of like threw myself at up work and just kept working and working and studying and studying and getting better at the craft until eventually like this landed and i just scooped it up it's good to like imagine as if you're actually talking with the person like just like imagine whoever is your ideal customer like think of what they're like and then write your copies if you're directly speaking with them so if you focus on delivering value you are getting recurring clients instead of always looking for new clients right if you're always doing the you know i don't care i got paid you're probably just gonna like have a like very high turnover you're gonna get new clients and that actually is quite like exhausting think about the journey that your like your reader is in and like decide how direct or indirect you want to be about the problem that they have especially on sensitive stuff like maybe take a little broader like perspective and, and like don't forget either like your goal is like to eventually bring them to the solution aware stage it isn't just to make them upset and angry about a problem like that'd be kind of a rude thing to do like the idea is like you, you present the problem and you you make them feel the problem and then you either directly or indirectly introduce the solution you can't just impose your will or your vision on someone else you need them to realize it they have to see what the problem is and they have to see what life could be like when the problem is gone, right? You should study copy really well. Like you should like annotate copy and you should uh, reverse engineer it. And like, honestly, like the whole read one piece of copy or long, one long firm sales setter a day is really good advice. And I would definitely give that advice to anyone who finds themselves into that like intermediate stage. Cause I know how hard that stage is, but like the only way to really get out is just like focus on that, like level up as a copywriter and then if you want to get to the really advanced stages, you know, like the six figure plus stages, I would say like learn how to do the marketing as well. Because if you can do the marketing and the copywriting, your value as a freelancer or as a consultant or as an employee or whatever just multiplies. You should have a very strong communication line between your audience and you. Like you should meet them where they are. You should talk with them. You should do your VOC research. Like however you can, you need to know what they're thinking, what they care about, what their desires are. And if you can't, you're you're not gonna be able to succeed. I feel like there are three stages that you go through as a, as a copywriter, where first you're learning how to please your client. Then you're in a sort of awkward stage where you are sort of like trying to balance how to please the client and how to please the customer of your client. And then in the last stage, you have mastery over being able to please your client and the customer of your client. And once you're at that stage, that's when you're you're looking at those 15K jobs. They just can't believe that these websites can make so much money. How much money can they make, Luke? Uh, you can make up to six figures a month. That's a lot of money, Luke. Yeah. That's a lot of figures. I'm yeah, skeptical. So, um, it will probably take you about a year to get to a thousand a month. But once you have a stable, like monthly revenue from your review site, 
you can generally sell it for a multiple of times 30. So if you have a website that does a thousand a month, and if you have a six month period where it's been earning that amount, then you can sell it for $30,000. If you have a problem with hemorrhoids, you're gonna wanna shrink them, obviously. You can't come out guns blazing being like, look at my hemorrhoid cream. You have to <laughs> ease people in, just softly apply knowledge until you're ready to apply the hemorrhoid cream <laughs> sale and offer this gently. If you're selling hemorrhoid cream, <laughs> yeah, I think we get the example. <laughs> It'll only hurt for a second, people. This taught me how to do Google PPC ads. It was actually my bathroom book for a long time. I just learned PPC while PPPing. If you aren't thinking about sales, you will be killed. What is my gender? <laughs> Obviously. Look at all this food. Look at it. It all looks mildly edible, just like Domino's. Domino's, mildly edible. If I were to sit down, and like somebody hired me, they couldn't afford me. But I would like to draw um, everyone's attention to one thing in this particular shot that Rod took is this dude right here. It was like, hey, why is that dude taking a picture of me? So you're thinking about this like a copywriter. Let's think about like a, a normal human. <laughs> Normal. <laughs> Wait, copyrights are normal human beings. No, they are not. I have oh. oatmeal and an energy drink. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm really good at plugging our Patreon. <clears throat> One of the things that I really like to draw a lot of attention to is my dick or the dick formula. You have the opportunity right now to sign up to Patreon and get exclusive app access to those episodes, so that next Monday, when you're in the chat, you can be joking about things we said that no one else knows about except for the other people who signed up to patreon and they'll be like oh yeah that guy or gal right there they really know they are a true fan of copy that and we love them a little bit more because of that that's pretty much it you're now product aware <laughs> <laughs> only the show will last exactly four minutes and 20 seconds i really like gun people's home pages be like your home page sucks and this is why um, <laughs> big fan of criticism. It felt kind of weak to me. What's the origin of that joke, by the way? Hey, Sean, really sorry about that. Uh, for some reason, this part of the video got corrupted. So, I don't know what to tell you. I guess no one will know what the origin of that joke is. We're not just writing like stories and stuff like that, like, you know, just to like jerk off into a puddle. Like, we're actually doing this with intent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do I say some of the things that I say? <laughs> I'm reading the comments. I immediately have regrets.